नमस्ते एंड गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन विल स्टार्ट आवर क्लास विद प्रेयर्स ओ गुरुर्ब्रह्म गुरुर्विष्णु गुरुर्देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात्ब्रह्म तस्म श्रीगुर नम ओ सहना सह नौ भुन सह वीर कर्वा वह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्त विदिषावह ओ शाति 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 नावल चैंड महामृत्युंजय मंत्र थ्री टाइम्स टू प्रे फॉर दोस हु आर इन सफरिंग ओ त्रयंवक यजामहे सुगंधि पुष्टिवर्धनम उर्वाक इव बंधना मृत्योर्मुक्षीयृता ओ त्रयंबक यजामहे सुगंधि पुष्टिवर्धनम उर्वाक इव बंधना मृत्योर्मुक्षीयृता ओ त्रयंबक यजामहे सुगंधि पुष्टिवर्धनम उर्वाक इव बंधना मृत्योर्मुक्षीयृता ओ शाति 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 वेलकम एवरी वन टूडे इज द लास्ट क्लास ऑफ दिस कोर्स द इन डेप्थ स्टडी ऑफ अ स्क्रिप्चर एंड वी चोज भगवद गीता सेकेंड चैप्टर द जेनेसिस ऑफ दिस कोर्स वॉज एज ए रिजल्ट ऑफ माई टेकिंग संस्कृत कोर्स so i first taught sanskrit 01 for beginners earlier this year in april and uh, there was a request for continuing the sanskrit course so then i thought let me take it in this manner that one part would be purely focused on grammar and another part would be how to use the sanskrit to understand the scripture so we took bhagavad gita as an example of applying those principles of sanskrit grammar to understand the scriptures this then there was a request also felt that people though he may not they may not know sanskrit very well but they may still want to Uh, listen to bhagavad gita so we made this course as a uh, part of the sanskrit course as well as an independent course where both aspects will be covered how the meaning of the words is derived from sanskrit grammatical principles as well as to understand the words and little bit of the philosophical aspect of it not like a really detailed commentary but just the simple meaning that what the verse is saying so as we moved along this journey in this course we decided to cover till the verse 30 because that's where the teachings of sankhya yoga the chapter name sankhya yoga 
that comes from the teachings covered up to this verse. Actually, the 20 verses from 2.11 to 2.30, this makes the crux of the name of this chapter, Sankhya Yoga. Sankhya generally in India refers to a particular school of philosophy. But here when in Bhagavad Gita it is called Sankhya Yoga, the second chapter, it is called Sankhya Yoga. I'll just write the name. Sankhya Yoga. It is related to a Vedantic teachings, not necessarily the Sankhya as the separate school of philosophy. The word here Sankhya refers to Samyak Akhyayate Iti Sankhya. The something by which you explain something very well, completely or clearly. That is Sankhya. And it in general relates to the Jnana Yoga. So generally these are equivalent terms. Sankhya Yoga and Jnana Yoga. And uh, that's where the second chapter or the teachings of Gita start from verse 211 and they go up to verse number 230. So that's why that's where we decided that we'll cover this much and we'll stop there in, as a part of this course. Second chapter itself has 72 verses and if there is interest then we can take the second part of the second chapter covering the remaining 42 verses which covers primarily the karma yoga a very important topic and also the characteristics of a realized person in addition to some other aspects that how if a person also follows his dharma can be free from sorrow so in today's class because we have already covered these 30 verses in detail along with the grammatical analysis so we were using this spreadsheet format we were where we were analyzing each and every word its grammatical structure and coming up with the meaning so in today's class because it is all done already we will just do a summary of these 30 verses of the second chapter we have studied so far. If there are any questions, you please, please feel free to write it in the chat window. We can have it as an interactive session. So as I said that this is the Sankhya Yoga or Jnana Yoga. Which that's the start of the teaching of Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita, if you go to the first chapter, Bhagavad Gita starts in the setting of the war. So this clan of Bharata, there was a great king called Bharata in India. In fact, the name of India, the name is actually Bharata. It has come from the same king it is believed that the name of bharata the land name of the land became bharata because of this great king happened named bharata so in his clan at some point of time people generally believe about 5000 5, years ago these two sets of cousin were there named Kauravas and Pandavas. And these two did not go along with each other very well. There was a dispute related to the kingdom. And Pandavas were the ones who were on the right, right side. Right, they were following the principles of righteousness, dharma. Duryodhana, the head of Kaurabas, he was not very particular about Dharma. So he grabbed their kingdom 
and when Pandavas asked for the kingdom, Duryodhana refused, leaving, leaving the way only for a war. There was nothing else which was acceptable to him. So the war was inevitable. And because this war was so comprehensive that almost every king of India at that time participated in it. It's called Mahabharata, the story of the great story of the clan of Bharata. Bharata. And in this war, on the Pandava side, there are five, five brothers. The middle brother Arjuna, he is the foremost warrior. He is the world-renowned archer. And he has all enthusiasm going into this war. Because he wants to uphold dharma, the righteousness. He has agreed to be as a part of his duty to participate in this war. And he also requested his friend, Lord Krishna, to be his companion. So Lord Krishna put a condition that I can join you in the war, but I will not hold the weapons. I will only, I can support you in the any other fashion except directly fighting. Is it acceptable to you? And Arjuna said, that's very well acceptable. You become my charioteer. And Lord Krishna accepted that rule. So Lord Krishna is the charioteer. Arjuna is the warrior on the chariot. And they both are in the battlefield. So when the war is about to begin, and that's the first chapter of Gita, Arjuna requests Lord Krishna that I want to see who all I have to fight. What you do, you take my chariot and place it between both the armies so that I can see both the sides. And I can decide on my strategy. And Lord Krishna said, yes, sir. And he placed the chariot between both the armies. The one thing which Lord Krishna did while placing the chariot in the middle of both the armies, that he placed the chariot where Bhishma and Drona are standing. Now, these two people, Bhishma and Drona, they were, they had been Arjuna's teachers. In When Arjuna was younger, Drona was the main person, his guru, who taught him the art of war. And Bhishma was the great grandfather by relationship, but also he taught these people. And Arjuna had tremendous love and devotion for them. And these people also loved Arjuna like anything. Yet the fate was such that they were in opposite camps in the battlefield. And this war was being fought to finish. So when Arjuna's, Lord Krishna placed Arjuna's chariot in the middle of both the armies and Arjuna started looking around and he sees Bhishma, he sees Drona, he sees many other people who are relatives, his cousins, his uncles and all the other relatives. A tremendous realization dawned upon him that this war which I am going to fight, people who will be killed, whether they are from this side, my side or the other side, they are the people very near and dear to me. And as a result, no matter who wins, it will be a loss. And more he thinks about it, 
more he is overcome by sorrow by his attachment and attachment resulting to sorrow and he started talking to lord krishna look for some reason we have decided upon this course of action but it was not right you see that people whom i love they are the ones who are standing here and they will die and not only those people and he started even quoting the scriptures that when all these people will die there will be nobody who will be offering them the there is a ceremony in india among hindus shraddha so you basically offer something to the ancestors to pacify them there will be nobody left to do that so they will fall into the lower worlds and on and on he went and even to the extent that he said it's better that i do not find if duryodhana on the other side they want to fight they can kill me even if i am without any weapons or without any mood to fight and it's better instead of me fighting and killing these people and more and more he went into this thought process more and more he felt depressed and finally to him it seemed that the only way out is to not fight this war to run away and he became so weak that he started crying arjuna who was the symbol of courage who was the symbol of never feeling any fear no matter what the circumstances he was so strong he started feeling very weak he could not even have the strength to hold his bow and arrow he drops them and he just sits down very dejected in the middle of the chariot so even though arjuna thought that the solution is not to fight the war he was not very clear about it somewhere in his in the back of his mind he also knew that to run away from the war is not the right thing because of this confusion he felt himself very weak and dejected and in sorrow and he just sat there so when arjuna is speaking all these things lord krishna did not say a word he just kept listening and then the second chapter starts so this was the background of the second chapter of gita then the second chapter starts so in gita bhagavad gita it is being narrated by sanjaya to dhritarashtra the minister to the blind king and so that's where the first verse starts of the bhagavad gita that sanjaya uvacha sanjaya said he spoke to arjuna who was overwhelmed with pity whose eyes were filled with tears and he was agitated to that arjuna lord spoke lord krishna spoke so in the next two verses 2 to 2 and 2 3 what lord does it's not really teaching it's more like is calling arjuna that how has this infatuation overtaken you at this odd hour this delusion this is not something which is pursued by the noble persons this does not lead to heaven or fame or glory and then in the next verse he is saying o arjuna do not yield to unmanliness this is not something which is behoving you so you give up this weakness of the heart and get up these are very strong words to arjuna 
Arjuna because as I told you, he was a warrior, unparalleled. Nobody, he was unmatched actually. So to hear these words, it was not easy for Arjuna to swallow, the, swallow these words. But two things, one, he is in such a state of dejection, confusion. On the second that Lord himself is telling these words, he, he listened to them and he started thinking. So first he becomes a little reactive. Maybe he was ex expecting that Lord will say, okay, what you are thinking is right. Let us go and let us go from the battlefield and tell Duryodhana that we do not want any kingdom and uh, we are ready to go to forest and let us not have the war. So maybe he was thinking that Lord Krishna would support his view. But it has come completely opposite. Not only Lord Krishna did not dis disagreed with him, he not only disagreed with him, but also chastised him pretty in pretty strong words. So then, if you look at that, it, it started Arjuna's thought process, a sort of reflection. So first a little bit he is reactive. He is saying, it's not that I, am, I have become unmanly or I, have, I am having fear of the war. But it is just that Bhishma and Drona, those whom I consider worthy of worship, how will I fight them with the arrows? How will I kill them in the battlefield? That some, certainly is not right. In fact, he then further justifies his thing that it is better to live on arms in this world with a, instead of slaying these noble people. Because we, if we kill them, what we will attain at the most, we will attain this kingdom and it all, all its, the, the objects of enjoyment, the pleasures, but they would be as if exchanged with their bloods. But more and more Arjuna reflected upon it. More and more it occurred to him that his problem is not simply that he has to kill Bhishma and Drona and other people. His problem is actually that he is simply not very clear what should he do. So he says he doesn't, we do not even know which is preferable for us, to fight or not to fight. Nor do we know whether we shall win or they, whether they will conquer us. The people whom we, after killing them, we ourselves would not like to be living, they are in front of us in the battlefield. So the situation, see, if Arjuna were very clear that all he wants to do is decided that War is not good. This is the solution of the problem. Become a monk. Live a life of arms. Then he would have just told Lord Krishna that this is what I have decided. And this is it. You take the chariot back. But that's not what he did. Because he is not sure what is the right course of action. So once he understands this confusion arising in him, that is creating the problem. He also understands that he is not able to solve this problem just by thinking. Just by analyzing this problem is not going to be resolved. Because this problem is much deeper than simply the current circumstance. It's not the, even though the emotions are evoked, because of particular circumstances. The problem is bigger than that. So he understood that in order to be free from this sorrow, this situation, he has to address that fundamental source of confusion and sorrow. And that is the ignorance. And he needs the knowledge, the highest good, 
that is called Shreyas in Sanskrit. So then in the next verses, he actually accepts that I am really overcome by this faint heartedness. The word he uses Karpanya Dosha. Karpanya refers to the sense of miserliness. So I have been given this intellect and the human life. And I have not been able to utilize it properly as a result I am in great confusion. So my whole being is puzzled because of that. And I have no clarity about what is my dharma. Dharma sammudha cheta. Regarding my dharma, I have no clarity. What is the right thing to do? So I become your disciple. Lord is, Lord, he tells, tells Lord Krishna. And tell me clearly and certainly that what is the right thing? What is Shreyas? What is decidedly good? Not just in the sense of for this particular circumstance, whether to fight or not to fight. Because that part Lord already told him that hey, get up and fight, get up, get up and fight. So he is not asking clearly only about this particular situation that tell me what is clearly good for me, decidedly good. He is looking for something which is the ultimate good for him. And that is their uh, technical word Shreya, Shreyas that is used for that purpose even in Upanishads. So, and Arjuna also knew that in order to attain this knowledge, he has to accept the discipleship. So he took the discipleship of Lord Krishna and saying, Shishyasteham Shadhi Maam Tom I am your disciple, please teach me. That is considered a very important verse in second chapter because that opens the door for the real teachings to start. Until unless there is a guru-disciple relationship in Vedantic literature, in Vedantic philosophy, the teachings truly cannot take place. In other words, you cannot arrive at these teachings just by observing the world and analyzing by yourself. That will not happen. You will not be able to find that I, I can, just by my analysis, I would be free from confusion and sorrow forever. That will not happen. So Arjuna understood that. That means you have to approach a person who has achieved that state and who can help you. And that person is Guru and you basically become the disciple to learn from that person. So Arjuna was of course very lucky here that he had Lord Krishna right in front and he was also ready. And then in the next verse, if you look at this part that Arjuna understands that it's not just about this kingdom, it's not about this war, he's saying that even if I attain this whole earth, the kingdom of the whole earth, without any enemies and it's very prosperous and also if i attain the kingdom of not only the earth but also of the heavens i do not see a way that will make me free from this soul this grief which is drying up my senses so if you look at these two verses That actually tells that Arjuna reflected upon the nature of the problem. He understood that his nature of the problem is not simply whether to fight or not to fight. He understood that his problem is arising simply because of this fundamental problem that he does not understand. He does not have the knowledge of how to be free from this basic confusion and sorrow. And he surrenders to Lord Krishna as disciple. So uh, after this verse, the actual teachings of Gita take place. So then this is again Sanjay informing Dhritarashtra that Lord Krishna spoke to Arjuna as if a little smiling. That smiling could be considered as either 
Lord is making mocking Arjuna because Arjuna is saying that I surrender to you and at the same time he is saying that I will not fight and he became silent. Or it can be understood that Lord became happy that finally Arjuna, I was, I have been waiting for this moment. Lord Krishna and Arjuna were friends their whole lives. And anybody who has this knowledge, the best gift he can give to another person is to impart this knowledge. And Lord Krishna must have been thinking that Arjuna, I have been waiting for you for this moment to come to me to ask for this knowledge. And finally that moment has come. So this verse can be taken in either way. And he started addressing Arjuna about this knowledge right in the middle of both the armies. So it's not that he said, let us go to a forest, there would be some peace and calmness. He actually, right in the middle of the armies, he started addressing Arjuna. So the very first verse, this is considered the by many masters, the starting verse of the teaching, of the Vedantic teaching of Bhagavad Gita 2.11. So he is saying, Arjuna, you grieve over those who should not be grieved for, and yet you speak like the learned. Wise men do not sorrow over the dead or the living. So they do not have any sorrow about either the dead or the living. That means they are free from sorrow. Who are the free, who are people who are free from the sorrow? Wise people. So wise people are not those who can speak like learned. So Arjuna, even though you are speaking like the wise people, but essentially you are in ignorant. That's essentially it means. Because if you truly were learned, if you truly were wise, you would not be in this state. You would be free from sorrow. Another way to understand this verse is that it is the knowledge which will free, which frees you from sorrow. And ignorance is the cause of the sorrow. So, in the very first verse, Lord Krishna actually makes it very clear that it is knowledge which will make you free from sorrow. And knowledge is not simply to be able to read the scripture and to be able to quote them, as Arjuna was doing, but to understand that self-knowledge which also be refers to who am I? That knowledge will make one free from sorrow. So, then Lord Krishna goes about describing. He doesn't use a lot of technical words in this section at least. It's very simple teachings, very straightforward. He is basically saying, look, these are the bodies and the inside the body there is an enduring self. And that self is free from this birth, death, any changes. On the other hand, the body or all the bodies, they are necessarily subject to all these changes. Knowing the nature, understanding the nature of these two, one who understands that very clearly, there doesn't remain any cause for sorrow. So he is saying in the verse 13, just as the boyhood, the youth and the old age are attributed to the soul through this body, even so it attains another body, the wise men do not feel deluded about it. So a death which Arjuna was really so much worried about, Lord is saying that it is just another state of the body. And it's, it's something unavoidable. That body is born. It is, it is a starting with the childhood. It, then it grows into the youthful stage. It grows into the old age. And it goes into the death. And then another body is taken up by the soul. So that part, knowing this, the wise people understand this fact very clearly. They do not treat death as something any extraordinary. Therefore, they are not deluded about it. And he is saying that 
the pairs of opposite which inflict all the people. A person who can maintain the equanimity in these pairs of opposite, he becomes eligible for immortality. What does it mean that he becomes eligible for immortality? So the, the idea is that the person is immortal, the, as a soul, as self, the person, the, it, it, he is immortal. The self never undergoes any death or the birth or change. But because I consider myself as body, subject to all sort of pairs of opposites, all sort of pleasure and pain, and if I take that as the real life, then I will never be free from that. But if I am able to take them in an equanimous spirit, then I can, that makes, that prepares me to understand the self, which is free from all this duality and free from all the sorrow. So it is not, it is not that one becomes immortal because one is able to, but one becomes eligible for learning that immortal aspect of his own nature. And then this verse is considered one of the very critical verse which summarizes the teachings that unreal has no existence and this is a little, little bit always difficult to translate verse because it says nasato vidyate bhava the, the unreal has no existence and the real never ceases to be there is never any moment that the real thing is not there. So something which is Sat, Sat is referred to as real here, that is always there. And something which is Asat, it never has a real existence. That means it never has any independent existence. Its existence depends upon the Sat, just like the wood and table. Table cannot have an independent independent existence separate from the wood. In that sense, the world, the whole world, all the bodies, they cannot have any independent existence separate from the Sat. The Sat itself is the name of existence. And he's saying that this thing this principle which I am telling you, it is not just my principle, but all the seers of the truth, they have clearly perceived this thing. And that's what I am telling. Then further again, he is further and further explaining to Arjuna that how the self is imperishable. And nobody has the power to destroy this. Just like the table has no power to destroy the wood. Similarly, there is nothing which can destroy the self because all other things have the existence dependent upon the self. So no, nothing has the power to destroy the self. And then if you look at this verse number 18, that anta vanta eme deha ha nityas yokta ha sharirina. These bodies are known to have the end. These bodies are known as such that they would come to an end. But the indweller self In this body, on, in all these bodies, that is eternal. That can never come to an end. That is not subject to destruction. Therefore, Arjuna, you fight. So, even if the bodies are destructible, 
and self is indestructible, what kind of teaching is this that you fight now? It's okay to destroy the body just because the bodies are subject to destruction. So that's not how it is. It's not that Lord is telling Arjuna to fight. Many times there is a confusion in the minds of people that Arjuna wanted to go away from the battlefield. But Lord Krishna persuaded him to fight. Lord, here in this situation, it was the duty of Arjuna to fight. He himself came to fight the war. He himself went to Lord Krishna to invite him to join him in the war. Arjuna understood very clearly that as a Kshatriya, his duty is to fight a righteous war. And he came to this battlefield for that purpose. Now, because of this delusion, he was moving away from his duty. Lord Krishna is telling that, look, what I have told you, this knowledge that should take care of your delusion, this confusion, and therefore you should resume your duty, which is to fight this war. So, if it were the, suppose, a student who would not be like to study because he wants to become, he, want, he, he doesn't like studies for some reason and he wants to become a sadhu, then Lord Krishna would have told the, the student that now you should study. I have told you these teachings, now you should study. So in that sense, Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna that therefore Arjuna, you fight, you should fight. Because that was just to remind his duty. It, it is the contextual, in the context of the war, these teachings are taking place. And therefore, Lord Krishna is telling Arjuna to perform the duty. Because he was, just like if a general, he is overcome by compassion in the battlefield. The enemy, enemy army would overtake the country. So that, that definitely will not be the right course of action for the general. So somebody who wants, who wants to give the advice to the general saying that, look, this compassion is misplaced, therefore you should fight. Not that one should fight just because that bodies are subject to restriction and self is indestructible, therefore one should fight. So, here in this verse number 20, he is saying, soul is never born, nor it ever dies, nor does it become only after being born, for it is unborn, eternal, everlasting, primeval, and even though the body is slain, the soul is not. So, there is a very juxtaposition with the body. Body is subject to birth, self is not. Body is subject to death, self is not. Body is subject to sometimes coming into the being and then also being there for some time and then subject to destruction, the self is not. And also the body finally is dead, uh, meets its death. Again, meet, having the death of the body does not affect the self at all. So, this, this verse in India is very popular. Vasansi Jirnani Yatha Vihaya. Many people chant this verse number 22 23 at the time of death of a person. That he is giving his example here just a man. He is shedding the, out, shedding the worn out garments, take the new ones. Likewise, the self casting off the worn out bodies enters into the others that are new. And this self, weapons cannot cut it, fire cannot burn it, water cannot wet it, and the wind cannot dry it. So it's not that the weapons which we have, that cannot cut it. Maybe some new weapons can be invented afterwards, they might be able to cut the self. So just to avoid that possibility and also that they cannot cut it in the physical sense, but sometimes people can, or they, the fire cannot burn it, but sometimes can people can feel that they are burning out of anger. Can that affect the self? So even that cannot affect the self. For he is saying 
that the self is incapable of being cut, incapable of being burnt. Here, the by fire is actually not the correct translation. It's incapable of not being, it's incapable of being burnt. That's what it means. Adaya. This is incapable of being burnt. So, this I just took the translation from one book. So that's why when you understand from the Sanskrit perspective, you can understand that where the translation is differing. And that was one of the purpose of this course that we can understand and have the proper understanding of the verse using the Sanskrit grammatical analysis. So he's saying that that is the nature of the self that it is eternal, omnipresent, immovable, constant, and everlasting. And then Lord Krishna tells Arjuna that knowing this, you should not grieve. It seems that it was very clear to Lord Krishna that Arjuna does, did not get that message. Like he is still grieving. And because he is still grieving, he tells Arjuna, Okay, even if you don't understand this thing, what I told you, but you consider that self as ever subject to the birth and death, even then, there is no room for sorrow. Why there is no room for sorrow? Because he is saying that anybody which is born is subject to death, and after the death, the rebirth is inevitable. Therefore, in this matter, which is unavoidable, there is no room for sorrow because we have the room for sorrow in which something we can do something. If we cannot do something and this thing is inevitable, whatever it may be, and I am being sorrow, then there could be that there can be no solution to that problem. So in that case, sorrow is simply a matter of not being able to understand the truth properly. He is saying that before this all the beings which you are grieving about like drona and bhishma all the beings they are unmanifest in the beginning manifest in the middle and again unmanifest in the end so what is there to sorrow about it is like an arrow which is coming from the dark then it is passing through the passage where there is a light and you see the arrow at that time and again it is arrow is moving it is bound to go into darkness again. So only for that middle portion, you are able to see that arrow, just like the bodies. So you are seeing that manifestation in the form of the bodies. It's not that there was nothing before or nothing after. It is just that you see the manifestation in between. So despite trying to explain Arjuna in all these fashion, Arjuna of, still has this grief. He still is finding it difficult to understand these teachings. So Lord is saying, look, it is not something that you are dumb that you are not able to understand. This thing is such that it's a huge wonder for anybody who is able to see that. It's a wonder. A person who is able to speak about that, that's also marvelous. That's a wonder. People hear it like as a wonder. And also it happens, it's, it happens that many people even after hearing do not understand this. And then he is concluding the teachings of this section that Dehi Nityam Abadhyoyam The self is ever imperishable, cannot be killed in this body, on all the bodies. So one self in all the bodies, that means bodies are subject to the destruction, but self is never. So knowing this about all the beings, you have no room for sorrow. You should not mourn for anyone. So that's where the teachings of this section ends. And because Arjuna doesn't understand these teachings, that means it doesn't become internalized for him. The sorrow is still a reality for him. Confusion is still a reality for him. Lord Krishna explains to the same teachings from different perspective till Arjuna understands. And that's what the whole Gita is about. So the second chapter, the remaining verses, 
Lord Krishna says that, okay, I told you this wisdom from the perspective of Jnana Yoga, Sankhya Yoga. Now I'll tell you from the perspective of Karma Yoga. So he explains the Karma Yoga. So, and then when Arjuna asks, asks the characteristics of a realized person, then Lord Krishna explains the characteristics of a realized person. So th this way, this chapter has the, uh, so it is considered the summary of whole Bhagavad Gita because it, con it con consists of all the essential teachings. So with this, if there are any questions, I would like to invite any questions. So please, please feel free to send in the chat window. And uh, as you might have seen, there is a message from Nivama. Happy Dashara to all. So today is actually indeed uh, a very, we are in the sacred days of nine days of Divine Mother, which culminates into the 10th day. Uh, that 10th day, depending upon in India or USA, I think here it is. Tomorrow in USA and in India it is Monday, this the Shahra. So uh, these are the very auspicious days, nine days of Divine Mother. So there is a question here. Thank you for these teachings. Can you please summarize the teachings of Karma Yoga in chapters two and how they differ from chapter three? So Karma Yoga is introduced in the second chapter and uh, because Arjuna has further questions they are further elaborated in chapter 3 and other chapters not just chapter 3 but in other chapters also those teachings are elaborated so uh, by itself it's a detailed topic of karma yoga and uh, many people find it difficult to understand that what is the thing which makes it karma yoga it's cert certainly not something that you do a lot of karma that becomes karma yoga uh, it is the spirit in which you do any karma even if somebody so one person doesn't have to change what he or she is doing just the attitude in which what she or he or she is doing has to be changed in order to practice karma yoga so thank you everybody i see messages from many of you and uh, i'm really happy and as a as we are also having the last class of the sanskrit course those of you those of you who are attending the sanskrit course this coming Monday, that would be also the concluding class of the Sanskrit course. So you can always send an email for any questions or suggestions or if you want. I also already asked you that if you have interest in continuing this course, you can send an email. Some of, the, some of you have sent, but you can also always send the email if you want to continue this. And then sometime later, I can take the remaining part of the second chapter also. And if there is also a request for any other scripture which you might be interested in, we can take another scripture also like Ramayanam or something like that. So I would definitely like the feedback from all of you to understand that what all would would be something that you would like you would really enjoy gita is nature a very natural choice because all of us are interested in gita but there are many other scriptures which we can take up and uh, discuss them together so please send those things with the on the email because that way we can have in the email uh, uh, whatever your suggestions questions feedback
and uh, remember this thing takes a little time like uh, we were able to do only two verses uh, because if we are going to do the sanskrit detailed sanskrit grammatical analysis then uh, it takes time and we were able to do this two verses per day so if we start this course for the remaining verses of second chapter there are 42 verses so roughly it will take 20 21 classes So with this, I'll conclude the class with the prayers. Thank you everybody for your love and appreciation and gratitude. It has been a beautiful journey for me also. It also became my own studies for Bhagavad Gita. So that way I also got to learn. And with this, we'll close the class with the prayers. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makashi Dukha Bhag Bhavet Om Puna Madaha Puna Midam Puna Puna Mudachyate Puna Sya Puna Madaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Thank you everyone.